wealth is not just money. Wealth is knowledge, wealth is your reputation, wealth is your health, like it's all those different things. And like a lot of people have it all wrong. They think it's like having a big watch and the, the Lamborghini or the, yeah. and not, not to say that stuff's not cool. At the age I'm at now, I think if I had the money, I don't think I would buy the Lamborghini. I think I'd buy something else. Thank you so much for joining us on the Evolve Your Brand podcast. I'm your host, Olia Murkies, and just want to give a huge shout out to Icon Industries, Shane times three, Steven, all the crew here. We cannot do this without you. We appreciate each and every one of you. And without further ado, the one and only Senator Porter. I'm not going to even tell you his first name because it's all about brand. <laughs> Welcome. Man, thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. You're the first senator I've had on. Perfect. I, I like that. I like that. So, Senator Porter. Yes, sir. You said this is my brand. Talk to me about that. How'd you come up with Senator Porter? Okay. Um, I used to work at Wells Fargo's corporate office um, many years ago in Minnesota, and one of my good friends, his name is Michael Bull. He was from Florida. We became really good friends. After a couple winters, he said, "Hey, I don't, I don't want to live in Minnesota anymore. So, I want to move back to Florida." So the girl, the reason why he ended up in Minnesota, he went to college in Wisconsin and he met a girl and he ended up going back after he graduated to Florida and things didn't work out in Florida. So he came back to Minnesota and was living with his girl. So then his girl was working at a mall at the time selling makeup and she's like, well, you should get a job and we could stay together or whatever. So he ends up getting a job and we both end up getting a job at Wells Fargo in the corporate office. And the first day we became buds and friends. We have lunch together every day. So him and that girl ended up getting married and then they moved to Florida. And then every summer they would come back to Minnesota to visit and, and see her family. And then we would, I mean, our friendship even till this day is, was from them. That's like, what, 20 something years later. So he would always say that I'd have a way of going to any place. And by the end of the, the time being there, everybody's my buddy or my friend or whatever. And he's like, yeah, you, you put it on that big smile. And all of a sudden it's like, you're running for office. And he called me Senator. Oh Paul. yeah. So, he's a genius. Yeah. So, and at this time I, I wasn't using it as my brand. He would be the only person to call me Senator Porter. So then, uh, moving forward years later, him and his wife been married for a while. And he, um, his wife had a sister and, sister came down to his, uh, see her niece. They ended up having a child and, um, and while they're in Minnesota, some of his close friends, one of them sees the sister. He's like, man, she's cute. So they started dating and he's in Florida, they're in Minnesota and they end up getting married. So now one of his best friends marries his sister-in-law. So then all those guys would, would say like, man, you guys go to Minnesota every summer. Yeah. One, one time we should come up there and do like a family trip. So he's like, cool. Uh, we'll go to a twins game. We'll go to all the little spots we used to go. We'll go to First Avenue. We'll go to all these different locations. We'll meet Senator Porter. So then they're like, okay, awesome. So um, he's like, hey. are they thinking they're going to meet a senator? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they really thought they're going to meet a senator. One of the girls is like, um, excited. So she's telling her mom, like, Hey, I'm going to meet a Senator. I'm going to do this. So I'm working for Wells Fargo still. So he's like, Hey, will you host us? If we come up there, like we'll go to do some stuff with we'll barbecue. I was like, yeah, no problem. Let me know when you get in town. So they get a, a VRBO, I think they call it, or like the Airbnb. It was before Airbnb, but they rent this house and I get off work. I head over there sit down at the barbecue and everyone's asked me all these political questions and what I think of this. I'm like, man, these guys in Florida are real political people. So then the, the girl was like, uh, or another girl was like, Hey, uh, so what made you run for office and become a Senator? And I was like, what? I was like, I'm a, I'm a loan officer for Wells Fargo. And she goes, Oh my God, I told my mom I'm going to meet Senator Porter. And so then after that, I just stuck. So then everyone started calling me Senator Porter in that group. And then during COVID, um, I was 
talking about branding and brand awareness and stuff. And I was like, man, I'm going to start using Senator Porter as my brand. And then next thing you know, that, that's how it all happened. How many years later now? Well, um, well it's been two years since COVID, right? Two yeah. and a half. Yeah, since COVID, that's when I started it. The Senator Reporter. Yeah, as as far as me introducing myself as that and okay. saying, but those guys, that's that's just what they call me as a nickname. So are we uh are are we ramping up for your for your run for a senator? I mean, you can't do any worse than these guys. I mean, no. have you met some politicians? No politics here, by the way. Yeah, no, I, You're not running for office? No, I'm not running. <laughs> I'd rather be the kingmaker and let someone else do that part. That is that is so cool. Yeah. Like who, who creates cool. like I was wondering, it's such a cool story about like oh, yeah. one of your boys comes up with your brain. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that that was the nickname. Like everybody, uh like my real name's Nakia, but yeah, if you ever notice when you have a unique name, it almost makes the person feel uncomfortable when they can't remember your name or they're introducing you. Like if you have like I'd have girlfriends and we meet their grandparents or something and and they're trying to say your name, they say it wrong, and then they feel, oh, I'm so sorry. And you don't, when you have a unique name, you don't really, it doesn't bother you that people can't say it because you're like, yeah, I know my mom did this to me. No, don't worry about it. It's cool. But then the the girlfriend would get all upset with the grandma. And you're like, let her, leave her alone. She's like, you know, 80 years old. Like, it's it's all good. You have a beautiful heart, my man. <laughs> it, it, it's hilarious. Like, I never run into that with Ollie and Oli. Never, never. Nobody right. ever. Right. I'm sorry. What's your name? <laughs> I get it all. Uh, do you say it this way? So it's funny that you say that. But mm -hmm. do people do feel guilty. They're like, oh, I'm so sorry. And oh, yeah. Yeah. Just, like, it's funny, too, um, with names. I, like, my name means people walk in victory. Um, way I got my name, my mother was in the hospital. My grandfather, um, his name is Lamar Porter. So my full name is Nakia Lamar Porter. Um, so I was going to be named Lamar. And then my mom likes mystery shows and she's, uh, in the hospital waiting to deliver and a mystery show comes on and the character in the show is named Nakia and she doesn't know how to spell it. She doesn't know what it means but for whatever reason. She loved that show. So after she delivered me, she goes, I want his name to be Nakia. So then the nurse is like, well, how do you spell it? She goes, I don't know. So she says, it's the N-I-K-I-A, and that's the feminine way to spell it. So growing up as a kid, oh, my God, I would get into fights. I got kicked out of a school because everybody was calling me uh, Nakima, the monkey from Tarzan. So I would fight these kids all the time. And my mom was like, what's wrong with you? Like, why are you getting so mad? And... I just want my name to be Michael or like right. Gregory or something like normal. You're like something, something easy yeah, to be home. It's because you remember you used to have to be like, I'm present when they would take roll call in, in school and the teacher would always mess up your name. The class started laughing. I'm like, man, I'm so sick of it. So I remember one year I went as Nick, like in like sixth grade. I was like, yeah, my name's Nick Porter or Nicholas Porter. And I didn't like my name. And then as I got older, I was like, you know what, whatever you laugh, it's, it's cool. Like that's, that's your thing. Yeah. And, and then yeah, I was good at sports and, and always a good student. So I didn't have to be like, so self-conscious of it. So it kind of helped me get thick skin with the name. But yeah, when I was little, like second, first grade, I hated my name. Okay. <laughs> I actually love your name. Well, that's what Do I'm you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's unique. I love it. It is. It is. But and you got named off a TV show. Oh yeah. Amazing. You, you know what? Even from birth, you were, you were in the, <laughs> hilarious. I'm just saying. That's hilarious. So, uh, one of the reasons I'm really, really excited to, uh, to have you on the show today is you have K2 currency. You're the yeah, host. Yeah. Ghost. yeah, absolutely. What, what's, what's the best experience? Uh, what's the best thing you le learned about yourself by being a podcast host? By hosting a podcast, I learned that um, to stick to something that you may not make any money from, but you could have an impact. And as you uh, you put that out to the world, and it, it's there forever. Like even that digital currency is there no matter what. And that wealth is not just money. Wealth is knowledge. Wealth is your reputation. Um, wealth is your health. Like. It's all those different things. And like a lot of people have it all wrong. They think it's like having a big watch and the, 
the Lamborghini or the yeah. And not not to say that stuff's not cool, but I I even at at the age I'm at now, I think if I had the money, I don't think I would buy the Lamborghini. I think I'd buy something else that doesn't doesn't uh, almost like give the wrong energy to people. Like I think if you love Lamborghinis and that's your thing, that's awesome. But if you're buying it to say, hey, look at me, I don't think that should be the, yeah. the route you're looking for. The it, the type of people that the energy that come back to you might not be what you want. Yeah. You know? Um, me personally, I agree with you a thousand percent. Mm -hmm. I think what means a lot to me is this and this. Right. These two. Um, as I've gotten older, oh, yeah. it puts things in perspective. Yeah. Some of the richest people I've ever met didn't have a lot of money. Yeah. But they were comfortable where they were in life. They were happy. People loved them. And then I've met people with a bunch of money and I could see the sadness, the the stuff they're trying to cover up, the anxiety, the they really don't have real friends. They're just around you because you got money or because they know you're gonna pay for everything. Right. I, I don't want I don't want people like that. Like to I want you to like me or don't like me. And if you don't like me, let me know. And that's yeah. cool too. Like, not everybody. I'm not for everybody. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know too many people that you're not for. Yeah. Just, you know, just saying. I, I, I know. I know. But I just want you to know that from me. Yeah, like, absolutely. you're one of the, like, I, I would say best people I've met in real estate. Nice. You know, you're supportive and it's all you put, you put out amazing energy, great vibes, always going out of your way to help for people. I think you're one of the, best people in real estate that I know. Hands, I appreciate that. Hands down. I, 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 try, yeah. I try to do my best of coming from the outside and not having anybody open the door for me or do anything. I want to be the person that isn't a gatekeeper. If I know something that'll help you, if I get monetary value from it or not, that doesn't matter. Like, let's try to raise the level of real estate and, and professionals and Oh my goodness. Yeah. Senator Porter just breaking it down. This is going to be a short. <laughs> so basically do the right things for the right reasons. Absolutely. Every day. Every day. It ain't about the money. Never. Yeah. The, the money will come if you do what's right. Always. Yeah. I, I love, I love to, I, I love being there to support other people. It means so much. It's like life is so much more than just about yourself. Yeah. I just just think about it. Um, you, you almost the endorphins you get from helping is addictive, and it when you do something for me and I do something for you, it becomes almost like a contest of doing what's right, and that's the type of energy we should have. And obviously, um, there's going to be tough days and stuff in real estate, but you could be having a tough day. I talk to you, edify you, and all of a sudden things just click. Everybody's moving in the right direction, you're going to have bad days. That's cool. But as long as you have a couple of wins, you only need a couple, not that many. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for sure. Seriously. Mm -hmm. So you sell money for a living as well. And yes, you've sir. sold it for a very, very long time. I had no idea. You've been in the, you've been in the industry for what, 25 plus years? Yes. Yeah, um, so the way I ended up even doing mortgages was accident. Um, I needed a job. I just had a baby. It was probably like in my young 20s, maybe 23, 24, maybe maybe older. But either way, um, I needed a job bad. And my friend, his name's Chris Jones. Um, he works for an Allied Bank now. I've known him since he was in probably third grade. He's my friend's little brother. And I look at them as a brother because they're one of the first families that I met where the mom and dad were in the household. Um, their father, Will Jones, was he he really uh took a liking to me and if I needed advice I could go to him. And we'd always look after his younger brother, uh, Chris. Um so Will Senior and Will Jones, Will and I were one grade apart and we played basketball. And his dad would always say, Hey, if you wanna go play, you gotta bring Chris with you and we'd be like, Oh, because Chris was just a menace. Like he <laughs> he would just do some of the craziest stuff to get a laugh or just to like annoy us. And we'd take him with us. So as we got older, he would always want to hang with us. It was like, hey, you're too young. You can't be doing the stuff we're doing. We're chasing girls and stuff in our teens. And he's in junior high. We go to high school. Then as we get out of high school, he's getting out of high school. He starts working at Taco Bell. And then he gets a first corporate job 
where he's working and doing debt collection. And I'm like, oh, I don't want everyone to do that. So he stops doing that and starts working for U.S. Bank doing mortgage debt collection. And at this point, I, I can't remember what job I was doing, but I needed work because um, I had child support and stuff. So he's right. like, come work with me. It'd be awesome. So, like, man, what do you do? And I'm like, I don't want to do that. And he's like, so this is the little kid that hung out with you guys. Yeah. Now nah, he's a, he's growing up. He's um probably in his twenties going to college. Okay. It's his part-time job. Right. So I was like, all right, I'll go and interview, get the job, knock out the park. You're doing debt collection. Can't be that hard. Right. Um, so how it works for a U.S. bank at the time, when you do debt collection, you start calling people that are like maybe five to 10 days late. Like, hey, your payment's late. Most right. people are like, oh, yeah, I could do a check over the phone. I was traveling. I was doing this and that. So you start getting the people to pay. So then they say, oh, you're you're graduating. Think of it like a video game. Now the stage gets harder. Now we're doing 15 days, 30 days, Got it. 60 days, 90 days, six months. And you get someone to pay after six months. Like, that's pretty crazy. They even have the house, but they had accounts like yeah. that. And um, like, they're all excited that I can get people to pay. And they're like, man, we see such a bright future for you. And in my mind, I'm like, man, as soon as I told my friend, Chris, I was like, as soon as my um, probation is over and you get your money for hiring me, I was like, I, I'm out of here. Like, this is a dead end job. And he came from working Taco Bell and he's going to college. So he doesn't see it that way. He's like, ah, this is getting, I'm not yeah. like, was, I'm like, yeah. For me, this is not my path. Like, I, I got to get out of here. So sure enough, um, there's the Minneapolis job fair going on. And I I found it in the newspaper on my way to work. So I was like, okay, so that's going to happen. I think it was like a Wednesday. So I wore a suit to work. Um, I get into my cubicle and I was like, okay, at lunchtime, I want to run over to the, um, the convention center and I'll just hand out as many resumes as I can and get back. I got 30 minutes. So I was like, okay, get, run to my car, jump in there, get to the convention center, hand out the resumes, run into this guy. And he's like, okay, I'm looking at your resume, sir. I see you got mortgage experience. I started laughing. I was like, no, sir, that's, I'm collecting like for a collection agency for U.S. Bank and we collect mortgage payments. And he goes, as I said, young man, I see you have mortgage experience, right? And I was like, I could pick up uh, what he's putting down. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I have it. He goes, okay, can you show up to this address on Monday and don't be late? I was like, yeah, no problem. I'll be there. Don't even know what the job is or anything. Freaking run back to work. I'm like three minutes late. Get to my desk. I'm sweating. I got a whole suit on. And like, Mr. Porter, can you uh, come to the office? I'm like, okay. So I go in the office. The two people that hired me sit me down. And they're like, yeah, um, we want to talk about why you're three minutes late from your lunch break. And I was like, yeah, I apologize. They're like, you got to understand when you're late, you have people on the sales floor that have been working hard to get their lunch and you not showing, uh, um, being uh, punctual is showing a huge disrespect to them. And they like go on this long path. And I was like, yeah. I, I want to talk for three to you minutes. Guys. Yeah. For three minutes. Like, so I was like, yeah, I want to talk to you guys about, cause you're on a dialer and stuff. Right. So they, they mess this stuff up if you don't get to your desk on time or whatever. But either way, I was like, yeah, I want to talk to you guys about this. Like, I really appreciate the opportunity, but this is my last day putting in my notice. And then their whole demeanor changed. So like, no, no, you don't got to quit. We're just, you're one of our best guys. And we would just want you to be a leader. And, right. and I was like, I appreciate all those kind words, but yeah, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to, you know, leave. So I ended up quitting the job, and then that Monday, showed up as the guy said. On, I was like five minutes early or whatever, and it turned out that that job was an opportunity to work for Wells Fargo's corporate office, and it was the first time they were setting up a call center and ramping up their sales team. So at this time, I had never bought a house before didn't know anything about mortgages or anything. So they put us in this room with a whiteboard and they're like, in the next two weeks, we're gonna make it where you know everything you need to know to sell mortgages. And they talked about, you know, 30 year amortization and live wars and um, purchase money and cash outs and bridge loans and 
all these different products that Wells Fargo did at that time. And that's how I met Michael Bull, who gave me my nickname because he was sitting at the front in a full three-piece suit, like nice suit with cufflinks and stuff. I'm sitting there with a sweatshirt and, and some jeans and some Nikes. And I said, why this dude, what up? And he's like, well, man, I'm from Florida. And we started talking, we became friends. And then sure enough, um, a couple of things happened. September 11th happened. So we get on a call on a, in the call center. And I, um, at the time, I was just doing refinances. I remember somebody called in about a purchase. And I was like, oh, I've never done one of these before. And I go talk to Michael because one thing, Michael, he, he had a degree in business and he worked for a broker in Milwaukee before he came to work for Wells Fargo. Got it. So he was kind of ahead of the game. He he knew all that stuff already. Right. Me, I, I'm just learning in my class. So then I was thinking that to do a purchase money loan and a refinance cash out were two different things when all you're really doing is hitting a different button. Right. Ask a couple of different questions. What is my first week? So I'm like, yeah, you want this purchase? The guy's ready to go. He found a property. He goes, you don't want it? I'm like, nah, I'm going to just do a refi. I know how to do that. So he's like, all right. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to transfer you to uh, one of my leaders on the team. I was transferring him over and I go get a refi. And like when I say we were doing numbers, like at this time rates were probably nine and a half percent. Um, So this was before September 11th. Um, people were happy to get down in the eights and the sevens. Got it. Um, so we're on a call center taking calls and there's a two hour hold time. When September 11th happened, the phones even rang more where there was three and a half hour hold time for someone to speak to you. So we're doing like 15 loans in a day. I think Michael did like over 20 loans in a day before. And it's just call after call, people calling you to like, it's not, it's not necessarily pressure sales because I'd be like, hey, Ali, how long you been on hold? Because you're like, I got to talk to my wife about this. It was like, oh, I've been on hold like two hours and 70 minutes. I'm like, all right, well, here's what we do, Ali. You like the numbers. Yeah, but I got to talk to my wife. Okay, well, why don't we do the application? If you cancel it, just email me and then you don't got to be on hold. But if you do like it, we'll have everything locked in. You won't miss out on this opportunity. You don't have to call me back and because right, the whole time's not going to change. You know where the right. market's at. So they'd be like, okay. So every day, four or five loans a day, every day, seven days, sometimes six days a week because they didn't let you work on Sunday. But we were we were temp, so we are making like $19 an hour. They didn't pay us commission, and we're just firing through the phone. Oh, there was no commission at that point. For for us because we came in as temps. That's what right. that but then the guys that were on the floor, they got commission. Got and that's, that's what your goal is to do your 90 day contract and then be hired and then be able to be a salesman. But it was a, as an opportunity that I'll never forget because I, I got so many opportunities to talk to people in New York, Hawaii, uh, all over the country. Um, you start to understand, um, uh, uh, just different terminologies, what the things you got to work, worry about in certain parts of the country. And it was just like a great experience where when I actually became like, uh, got boots on the ground kind of guy, I knew like there's not something you could show me where I'm like, oh, I don't know what that is. But another guy, he wouldn't know. And sometimes maybe say, hey, there's not opportunity here. But I'm like, no, nah, I've seen this before. Like you could actually do this. Experience goes a long way. Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's what's interesting is... Uh... <sighs> Uh, when people call, I, I think we've trained them to focus on interest rate. Right. Okay. Um, one of the funny things I always see on social media is, uh, you know, um, interest rates don't matter. Right. Interest rates don't matter. A lot of real estate professionals say interest rates don't matter. Right. And I could see that when you have knowledge base and you've been through real estate transactions, why someone like an investor would say that. But your average first time home buyer, Interest rates are going to matter because everybody in their circle is saying interest rates matter. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Do interest rates matter? I think that I've been through so many cycles now from, shoot, 1998 until today that rates are going to drop. So if you're in a position where you can afford to buy some, it's your primary home. I mean, you should buy it. Maybe do like an arm rate or something like that. But um well, eventually rates are going to drop. Like it's, it's just, if you look at the history, it happens. 
it just cycles. Um, sometimes people get in a political space where they get upset about who's pushing this lever and that lever. Right. But it is it's it's bigger than that. Like there's all these other um, I guess you would say entities that are making the market do what it does. And with the with the good and bad of it, it's kind of amazing that you can get someone to come work for you for two to three weeks and not pay them anything. But if we wanted to go get a sandwich at the store, they want their money right then. Yeah. But the people that are making that sandwich, they're not getting paid for a while. And, and that's what a lot of people don't realize when the loan officers too. Um, when we worked for that corporation, we would do, I think the most I closed in a month is like 75 loans. You don't get a bonus. You don't get that commission for a month. It's like a month delay. So you're like, oh, I'm gonna make this amount of money and this and that, but that money doesn't come out. But the appraiser gets paid right then. The title company gets paid right then. The realtor gets paid right then. And you're taking the brunt of all the abuse of everybody in this transaction. And you don't get paid from a month from now. So a lot of people don't think about that. Yeah, it's, you know, um, I love the fact that you said, as long as the payment is affordable. Right. You know, and, that, and that's the key. I think, right. you know, um, I joke around when I'm at open houses that I sell money for a living. Right. Well, what I really mean is I can explain how money works for you and your family. Mm -hmm. So that way you can make, I can guide you to decision that's best for you oh, and yeah. your family. So I, I've taken the approach of, because you're this way. Right. How come you prioritize people in, in our industry over the profit? How come it's people over profits for you? I think um, working in the call center, you kind of are trying to get people to where they're supposed to go. Because sometimes they'll call our line, they need to get to customer service or they need to get to trust accounting or something that you don't do. So you're like, hey, I need to get to the next sale. I, is there a deal here? There's no deal. So let's say I transfer that deal to you and you make a million dollars, but I don't get commission off of that. So why do I care what you make? And that's the, the I want that person to have a good experience when they spoke to me that they're getting where they need to go and not try to make money off you. Like uh, my, my new quote that I, you could steal it if you want to. I will. Is, I, will. Uh, is I want to make uh, money with you, not make money off you. Because I think that's where people get it wrong. Like, okay, you'll, perfect. You'll, you'll talk to someone and you can feel like, they're trying to get you to buy something or make a buck off of you. And they're missing the fact that if you help me make money, like we'll do like video editors. A lot of times they'll have a specific price they want to make. Um, they want to make a certain amount of money per month and got packages. And you're like, all right, well, is there is this negotiable? Like, what if I, what if you help me make my podcast look better and by me looking better, my friends that have the money to pay the price you want to pay, you'll get access to those people. Do you see value with that? And a lot of the young guys, they don't, they don't see that as value. Yeah. When I was a kid, if you could just get me around the people, I'll, I'll work for free. I just want to get in that room somehow and I'll, I'll show that I'm valuable to be in this group. But now, I mean, and not, not, I can't blame the kids because people are making more money and they want to, they want to get there faster. But I think if they were willing to help you look good, then the money will come. Like yeah. if, I, if I help you get whatever you need, you'll be, uh, what would you say, almost indebted to me. Because you're like, hey, I needed to make X amount of money. This dude helped me do that five times. Whatever this guy needs, he's good because he helped me. Uh, I want to make money with you. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I actually live my, uh, my mortgage advising business is all about making money and helping people solve problems. Right. That's it. Right. That's it. Like if I understand how money works and I can explain it to someone and they get to make better decisions and make money. Oh yeah. What price do you put on that? Oh, and it is so much more fun when everybody has money. The bill comes, you're like, ah, okay, I got it. Versus you've been at a group and people ordered all these appetizers and stuff and the bill comes and now everyone's like, wait, let me look at it. I don't, I don't want to be arguing about that kind yeah. of stuff. You know, it's just, it's like low vibration thoughts. You know? Who do you, like, how do you, uh, <clears throat> what are the habits that you live every day that allow Senator Porter 
to have the most energy in almost every room. Man, that's a good one. I think every day I try to get up, do some type of gratitude, get a workout in uh, so I can get my thoughts kind of like yesterday. I was thinking about today. What am I going to wear? Um, I want to get there early. I want to make sure I've got Then after this, I got to go to um, a VA rep event. There's uh, another event. So I, the day before I make sure I'm, I know what I got to do the, the next day. I try to put it on the calendar because when I have so many thoughts going on in my head, if I don't do that, then I'm like behind and I want to make sure I'm, I'm early to stuff. I don't, I don't like being late to things. Like when I was younger, I didn't care about that stuff. But as I get the gray hairs and get older, I, I really want to be on time to things. I really want to show up for myself and, and show up for the people that I help and support. Yeah. In, in like, where does your giving spirit come from? Because you, you support everyone, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you're at all the events, always doing right. Always having positive conversations, always have a smile on your face. What keeps you centered doing that every day? And I, I think it's easy to do the gloom and doom and say the world's going to end and the market's going to crash and all these things. And some of those things have happened before. But we're still here. We're still around. And the people that stuck with it, those are the guys that made it through that, that storm. And now the sun comes out. Now we're on the beach, like chilling out, kicking it. So you just got to know that no matter how bad things are, you're not going to stay that way if you're working to make it better. And eventually it's going to get better. You just got to keep doing the work. Don't sit on the ground and not continue that journey. And it's going to be bumpy sometimes. Like yeah. when I came out here, I didn't know one person. Like I've took this job. I was promised all these things. And none of the things that promised me were anything close to what I was promised. And now I moved here. My expenses are three times as much. I'm like, oh, my God, what did I do? Like, what, <laughs> what did I do to myself? And then I could have said, all right, well, you know what? If this ain't work out. I'm going to go back to Florida. And I was like, nope. I'm, I'm going to figure this out. Like, how are all these people living here? Um, I toured a house one time in Rancho Santa Fe, and it was a hundred, $138 million house, if I believe it was right. It had, like, a stable, uh, had two houses on the land, um, and the guy hadn't lived in the home over four years. His wife, he built it for his wife. His wife passed. Once she passed, he didn't want to live there by himself. Yeah. So then he was trying to sell it, and at this time, the market wasn't that great. Rates were uh, like up in the sixes and um, nobody wanted to spend that kind of money on the house. So then they were talking about, because it was such a large piece of land of parceling out the land right. to make it where it would be two different properties to lower the price. And then he could sell the two houses and get the money. So then when I was touring this house, I'm like, man, there gotta be a way that I can make money to live in San Diego. This guy's did this. I, I just need to figure out, maybe I'm not going to have the 138 million, but I should be able to pay 3000 in rent. Like, right. imagine what he had to do. So and then that was like, okay, let's, let's kind of work this backwards. Let's start getting with people and then networking with different people, trying to find that information. A lot of people aren't like me. They're not trying to like, when I see a young dude or a young woman that's out there hustling, trying to make it happen. How can you not try to help that person? Like, how can you be like, oh, they got to get it on their own. They got to, but why wouldn't you say, well, hey, try this. Now, if you tell them that information, they don't use it, that's on them, which happens a lot with all kinds of people. Of all, even I've done that where somebody told me I need uh, seven to eight hours of sleep. I'm like, I'm good with four. No, you, you need to sleep. You live longer if you sleep. So um, I think that that's what keeps me centered is I remember coming here and nobody helping me, nobody want me to come to events, um, you know, um, and then saying, you know what, I'm going to make my own events. I'm going to start doing my own thing. I'm going to start uh, making people that I like that give me the energy I want come to my events. And if you don't like what I'm doing, that's cool too. We're still going to have a good time if there's only five people here, you know? So that that's kind of what I would say. You don't call a whistle, right? I believe so. Okay. Uh, he's got a pretty big team in, uh, 
La Mesa, East County area. Okay. And I was at an event he spoke to and he said, you know, we've, he's, he's very, very successful. Nice. He's like, we'll invite 1200 of our clients, wow. you know, to the event. And to be honest with you, there's no way if everybody showed up, I can't talk to everyone. Right. I'd rather have five people. Right. I'm like, okay. Right. And, and what, what stood out about, about that was anything can be good and anything can be bad. Oh, yeah. It's your mindset and how you think and the energy that you put out there. You've spent so much time talking about energy. Where did you like, when was it that moment where you're like, the energy I put out in the world is going to come back to me and I'm going to put out the right energy. Do you remember that moment that that happened? Probably with sports. Really? Yeah, okay. You, I think I, in my opinion, there's two things all kids should do. One, they should um, work at a bank at some point in their life. And then two, they should um, play sports. And the, and the kids that don't play sports, I kind of feel like they miss out because yeah. they don't they don't get a chance. And it, you don't even got to be an all-star or whatever, but just understanding adversity, losing, how to like work with other people that aren't like you, um, just kind of like how to how to take criticism, how to be coachable. Like this, sports just does all that stuff. And it's kind of under undervalued uh, in my opinion. Like you don't get those life lessons. And then if you go through life, let's say you are a bookworm or whatever, and you don't ever play a sport, then you get out into the world and you're really smart or you could be really rich, but you don't know how to like go through all those different emotions and, and have that self-control. Yeah, I think you'll appreciate this. So uh, I'm going to give a shout out to my personal trainer, Zeke, uh, Zeke Training. Okay. He's a Marine, 26 years old. You were talking right. about making a difference for young men, right? You know, young people. It doesn't really yeah, matter. Yeah. Like anyone. Mm -hmm. um, my 17 year old Luke and I are going tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We're doing this workout together. And yeah. I, I shared with my boys, I said, hey, look, you know, I'm doing this, getting a personal trainer for us. So we have a family activity. And I think once you have your wellness and health taking care of at an early age, well, yeah. you're just happier in life. In my opinion, I was overweight for a lot of my life. Yeah. I, and with the information that we have now, there's no reason, no reason not to, to educate our, our you know, oh, my yeah. kids, you know what I, I mean? Agree. So I agree with you, like with the, with the sports and the banking, that that's great. Oh, yeah. I love that. So elaborate on that. How yeah. come do you think most kids need to work at a bank? What, what, what are they going to get out of it? Yeah. So, um, I worked for a credit union. Um, after I was a temp at Wells, I went to work for a credit union and at the credit union, you'd have to wear a tie a nice shirt and slacks and some nice shoes. So at first I had a couple pair, but as I started working at the bank more, I wanted to have the best tie. I wanted to have the best shirt. And then meanwhile, I'm helping people and they have on like some bummy shoes or whatever. And uh, one guy, he would, uh, he would actually pay his car payment. He want me to staple the receipt and uh, print out the statement and then put it in this freaking uh, like white, like almost like a bag they give you at the gas station. And that was like his filing cabinet. And then I open up his account and he has probably like $68,000 cash in his account, not doing anything with it. Cause that's just not how he operated. He wasn't an investor. He right. wanted his cash. So then I asked him, he was, a, I think he was a Laos or, or he was, he was Asian, had a really thick accent. And he's like, I don't, I don't, if I don't need it, I don't buy it. He goes, I wear these same shoes until I can't wear them anymore. Clothes, I, I have a couple pair of clothes and I'm thinking like, this dude has more money in his account than I made last year. Right. And I got a bunch of debt um, and I got all these clothes and ties and all this stuff. And this dude could easily not work because I was looking at his expenses. He, you didn't have to work for a couple of years if you didn't want to. And he made less money than me too, but he has more money than me. And then I was like, this is something I need to change. So then I quit buying as much clothes. I quit spending as much on my credit cards. I started putting money away to save. And it just had a reflection of myself saying, hey, I'm doing something wrong. Like this guy got it right. 
who am I trying to look so good for? And I, if anyone even knows me, I like to look fresh. Like, yeah, you do. <laughs> look at the shirt, man. Like, look at this shirt. He walks in. I'm like, he's got me. His shirt's a lot cooler than mine. <laughs> but, but you gotta, you gotta do it in moderation. You can't get every latest right. thing that's coming out and, and be so much of a consumer. You got to, yeah. and that, that's another part of it too. I, I want to start putting out more than taking from the world as a, as a whole, whether it be, if I can give you information to help your business do more, I don't get any money from that, but I get a, a, a feeling of helping somebody that when I needed help, wouldn't help me or give somebody a ride. If they need a ride, Hey, you've been drinking. Most people be like, oh, I'll take an Uber. I'll, I'll run you to your house real quick. You don't got to take an Uber. Hop on in. Most people are like, no, no, I don't want to you know, put you out or whatever. I mean, we're not walking to your house. You're not jumping on my back. <laughs> Hop in the car, bro. It's no big deal. Like one well, friend was fighting with me and we live the same direction. Like I had to take an exit or two more and then turn around. Gas ain't that high yet. You know, like, but that's the, the way I view stuff. I think Senator Reporter should run for office. No, sir. No? <laughs> no politics for you? No, no. I, I don't. I think that there's good people that are, yeah. are are able to do things, but there's too much red tape and, and other things that are, are involved in politics that I don't like. And they, they, in media itself, try to flip the narrative of things um, from it being one story in the beginning but then if the argument starts to change and all of a sudden the whole argument changes to something else and we get away from what we were originally trying to fix. Yeah. And, and I think uh, I was joking with the run for <laughs> office. I, I wouldn't do that. You look very happy and I want you to stay happy. Yeah. Running for office, I don't think would be very happy. Oh man, I have way more agree. It, it's putting out, um, what I appreciate you is the ROI. I heard this on Jeff Finster's podcast. Oh yeah, like Jeff. Jeff is awesome. Yeah, he's great people. Yeah, and uh, I have a huge appreciation for him because he's going out there and he's taking all the like he's just so creative. Dan was talking about Dan and uh, Fulkerson yeah. and him are good friends. He's like, if I get a call from Jeff. And he's got an investment opportunity. I don't even ask any questions. How much do you need? And, and I love people that are innovative and see opportunity. He had a guest on and he said ROI. Now, you and I have heard ROI. How long? It's always return on investment. Right. That's not the I definition this guy had. Okay. And I got to call him out. I, I, I'm going to put the link to it, but return on impact. Okay. That's, That's what you nice love. too. Yeah, you live I, that every day. I definitely want to make sure that I, I put a, a imprint on on why I'm here to help as many people as I can in whatever it is. Because sometimes you get information, and to me, that's the new currency. Yeah, you you get this information that isn't something that affect me and you, but then you got a friend who needs that information, and just because you were in a room and you heard somebody talking about it, you can connect this person that could change everything. Yeah. You know? And, and I, I think that's what you look for. And as I've gotten, you know, older, I'm, I'm doing the same exact thing. I'm like, who are the people that, you know, you, you, um, do something for them or you give them a device, you have a conversation. Uh, we have a 21 year old that, that came and he's been looking for Alex Hermosi's book. Okay. hundred million dollar uh, lead. Nice. And so he's like, I went to the bookstore. I couldn't find it. So I ordered a copy for him on Amazon yesterday. Nice. And I'm like, give it to him. He's like 21 years old. He's building. I'm like, why not dude? Right. Like yeah. if you do right by people, the world do, will do right by you. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, I gotta wait till Christmas time to give like that's, thing you can give every day like yeah in san diego we got a big homeless population and when i see somebody that's in a bad place some people will be like oh get a job or do this i'm thinking like man what did that person do in their life what decision did they make where they can't stay with a friend they can't stay with a cousin on the couch you gotta be out here on the sidewalk like something bad happened like some where you were hurt or something's going on where and like how we have so many people in that situation. But then I say, well, no matter what kind of car I have, no matter what clothes I have, you should be grateful that you're not in that situation. And how many people look at it that way? They don't. They, oh, I don't have the Rolex. I don't have the 
Lamborghini or, you know, yeah, you don't, but you have a place to live, you have food, you have people that love you. You be grateful for those things. Some people don't have that. Like that guy yeah. wish wish he he trade places with you in a second. Like <laughs> in a second he would trade with you. Perspective. Yeah, heck yeah. yeah. It and goes I a long way. Think that more people need it. Said reporter, who do you wanna uh who do you wanna think? Like who makes your day better every day? Who who are people that have put a smile on your face that you're gratitude you're grateful that they grateful. made an impact on your life? Um obviously my mother, um I have an aunt that passed away, my aunt Ramona, uh, my uncle James Haynes. Uh, as far as professional-wise, um, shoot, I got a lot of people, uh, mentors, pretty much all my managers from Wells Fargo. Uh, and uh, I, I'm obviously God, um, my my grandmother, like I, I could go on and on. Just different friends that I've worked with, different relationships of friends that I've had. A lot of people have looked out for me when when they didn't have to. That's that's the beauty. That guy that got me the job at Wells Fargo, he changed everything. Like, Chris? I don't even know his name. Oh no, no, it wasn't Chris. That, uh, Chris was the one that that uh, oh, opened the yeah. door. Yeah, for yeah, you to Chris go to Jones U.S. Bank, right? Yeah, yeah, he <laughs> opened the door for Matt, me. Chris the Menace. Yeah. That's what his nickname yeah, is now yeah. for me. <laughs> Chris, Chris Jones definitely. Uh, Will Jones, his father, like tons of. The list goes on. All my coaches, like it, it's a big list of people I, I could think of and thank. If I'm, I should write out that list one day. Um. I hope they watch this and they realize the impact they made on you and the impact that you're making on other people. Yeah. I, well, I hope they do too, but even if they don't, man, people know, like I always will. I try to show love to everybody that I know. If, if, if I can help you or do anything for you, I'm, I'm going to do it. Like you don't got to worry. And I don't, I don't look for nothing in return, pay it forward to somebody else. Cause we all, we all need more people that are, trying to give that energy out because you, all you got to do is scroll up on your phone and see all the negative stuff. Uh, I was watching that, that uh, podcast a friend sent me and they were talking about the, the red pill community and yeah. how now it's like everyone's talking about you don't need a woman and you don't need this and um, a man's value is this. And um, they were saying in their opinion of like how, how of a part of life that person is missing out on if all they're focused on is money and themselves and um, just um, being in all these different relationships and not valuing a woman. And then they're going to get to a point in their life where they're just alone. And that, that's why so many males will commit suicide at 60 that are successful because they went through this part of their life where it's just all about the physical, all about the way someone looks or having sex with them. And and you don't get to make a family and, and have all these things. And, and like me, uh, growing up in Minnesota, one of my cousins, he actually played uh, professional football for the Minnesota Vikings. So who? Um, his name is Anthony Phillips. Okay. So I'm in my 20s, and he ends up getting signed by Dennis Green, and it was Randy Moss's rookie year. So when um, he calls me, he went to Texas A&I, he played football with John Randall. So, I remember Anthony Phillips. Yeah. So that's your cousin. Yeah. So he, he, um, basically was like, Hey, whenever we're done with practice, come pick me up. I'll have a car and we'll hang out. So as I was hanging out with him, I got to meet all these athletes and see the decisions they make, see the money that they're making. And over time I started becoming friends with them. My cousin ended up getting uh, cut after that season. So I was like, oh, that was cool. I got to be around all these players and, and go to games for free, and it was cool. But then what ended up happening was um, a lot of them guys were became my friends, and then they were like, hey, what are you doing? The season's over. Let's hang out. So now I became friends with um, Randy Moss, Eric Moss, Dante Culpepper, um, uh, Nate Burleson. Get um, out. Michael Bennett, um, Corey Chavis, all these different players, pretty much – from 98 on, I was with, with that that group of guys. we go out, I'm in my 20s, we we're going out to the nightclubs, we're going out to do everything. But I got to see, like, the decisions that guys make. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, you're not above the law. You can get in trouble. 
you can make one wrong decision and change everything. I remember uh, one night we were out and Fred Smoot, you remember Fred Smoot? Yeah. He was inviting us to this party at his house. And um, the players I were like, ah, Fred's too wild. I'm not going. Gotcha. And uh, I was like, yeah, okay. So I just went with my friends. Um, it wasn't that particular night, but literally Fred Smoot, um, Brian McKinney, all these guys were throwing these crazy parties. And one of them was the infamous boat party. And my friends that I hung with wouldn't went on that boat party. But the younger players that look up to those guys would have that situation. And now if you're married or something, now you're in a whole other situation you got to explain. But it's just all decisions. So being around those guys at such a young age, I started saying, okay, well, here's stuff I'm never going to do. Never going to drink and drive. I'm not mess around with drugs. Um, you know, doesn't matter. Even though you have access to things, doesn't mean you have to take the animal instinct out of it, be a human being and use your brain to make decisions and make good choices. And I haven't always made the best choices, but I'm well, probably 90% making good <laughs> <laughs> You're as close as there is yeah, to making the good. To try to make the right choice. And it's funny, sometimes, you know, the choices that, that I've made, I'm like, dude, uh, if you cl create collateral damage in your own life, you have one person to look at in the mirror. Well, you know, and that's the thing too, when you do make a mistake, don't just sit in the mistake for years and years. That's yeah. what a lot of people do. Oh, I made a bad choice and had to file bankruptcy. I can never buy a house. So then what our job is to do is like, well, yeah, you made that choice, but after seven years, you can buy a house again. Oh, I can. And then you start just trying to help them fix that, that, um, that broken mind and say, yeah, you made a bad choice. And not the end of the world. Here's the steps you need to take to make better choices and don't do that again. You know, that's, that's the thing too. Don't keep doing self-sabotage and hurting yourself. And that's kind of one of the be beauties of what we do with, with, um, like you said, selling money to people is get, helping them understand the rules of the game. Like yeah. when I went and bought my first car, I didn't know the rules of the game. And, uh, I remember a guy that he actually, um, doesn't sell cars anymore, but in Minneapolis, there's a, a Feldman's Nissan and Mercedes dealership. And I wanted a Maxima. And at the time I didn't make that much money, but I had good credit. So I go in there and this guy talking to me, he's older than me. Um, and he's like, uh, that's too much car for you. And I got offended. I was like, what do you mean? That's too much car for me. I work and I, I pay my bills on time. He goes, yeah, but you're a young guy. And we can't, we can't anticipate how much money you're going to make moving forward. You hope you make more money, but what if you don't? He goes, instead of you getting that Maxima, you should get that Nissan Sentra. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, but I want to have the, uh, the keyless entry and all that. That car doesn't have that. He goes, well, we'll, we'll add a aftermarket thing on that. But if you buy that car, you'll be way better off. So I listened to him because I, looked up to him or whatever. And I ended up doing that. And like all my other friends got the bigger cars and like some of them were like struggling to make payments. Some of them weren't, but I never had that issue because I was like, yeah, this payment ain't even like two, 300 bucks. I could work part-time and go to school and still make my payment. I was never stressed. So getting into banking after that, I just always was like, yeah, I don't want that stress of buying all these things to have them and you feel good for a second. But after a while, it's just a TV. It's just a watch, just a yeah. car. And you don't even, when you first buy something, you're really taken care of. But after a while, it's all dirty. You like got a bunch of crap in this driver's seat or, or the passenger seat. So I, I think that's something that a lot of people should think about. Yeah. You know what? <clears throat> I That guy at the dealership, I'm a huge fan. Oh, yeah. I'm a huge fan. He prevented you from making a big mistake. Yeah, so his situation was unique as well because he was a private investigator. He um, was out of Chicago. He got a girl pregnant and ended up coming to Minnesota to be with his son. He needed a job, so then he ended up selling cars. But then he ended up having a relationship with someone else who introduced them to Usher, and because of his... um like, uh, I guess you say law enforcement stuff. He became Usher's bodyguard when Usher blew up. 
So now he has like a, um, uh, I guess you would say a security firm. So he takes care of like Rihanna, 50 Cent. That doesn't uh, surprise me though. Yeah, but imagine this dude was just selling cars and then that went somewhere else, you know? Yeah, but he was selling cars, but he was taking care of people. No, no, but that's what That's point. amazing. It, it doesn't, I, for me, I never look at people of where you are right yeah. now because it could change. You could be up here and I've seen guys drop down here and I've seen people be down here and now they're up here. So it could change. So the way you treat people when you're on top or when you're down, when you're falling, you may have somebody that could snatch you up and be like, whoa, you're not time for you to come down yet. Here's a loan. Here, let me help you get this out of out. Or if you're really crappy to people, they'll be like, yeah, you stay down there. And we'll make sure you stay down there. Right. So that that's how you how you going up. Can't <laughs> it be the same how you going down? I, I I love that story because it's like you you could tell with that guy, and uh, that's one thing that I've gotten better at is like I, I I really look for the good in everyone. Oh yeah. How can I make a difference? How can I do something to do right by other people? Goes a long way. I mean, like you hope that people aren't evil, but when someone does something yeah. like. Why are they doing it is the question we should ask. Like, why why does this police officer treat people that way? Why does this manager treat customers this way? Like, what what's going on with you? It's way easier to be nice. It's hard to be, Seriously. like, freaking aggressive all the time. Imagine if it, we were, like, trying to be aggressive to everyone. All that That's a lot of, like, that's a lot of weight. I don't. I don't want that. <laughs> he, I, I. I was that guy. I mm -hmm. was the aggressive guy because to me it was like my aggression is passion. Sure, but it comes across aggressive, and now I'm like more calm. Yeah. You know, and it's like I'm aggressive towards the right things, and really, really calculated towards everything else. You should always because think about it. Have you ever done a loan where everything's going fine and then it start going sideways, and then all these people are calling you and stuff. And then you got meetings or something, so you can't take the call. And then you finally get on the phone to rectify the situation, and it's all fixed. Yep. But if you would have been, like, in the middle of all that wind, it never would have got fixed, or you would have just been getting beat up the whole day. So sometimes what I've learned is, hey, take a second. Let, let, let's look at this. What's the true damage? What What are we dealing with here? Okay, what are our solutions? Come with a, Come with a solution. Don't just criticize people and don't offer them a solution. And you're just a hater. Like, don't be that. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I, I saw what you did. I, I mean, I know you're trying your best. As a friend, here's some suggestions that I, I want you to do better. And these are ways you can make it better. Versus like, hey, man, that was sucked. Like, I, I heard your podcast. I didn't like this and that. And don't offer no solution. Don't, yeah. like, that's a hater. Like, you're just hating. Yeah. But if you come at someone's like, I really like what you're doing so far. Here's some things that could even make it go to the next level. That person's like, wow, thank you for saying you like what I'm doing. And thank you for trying to help me do it. I didn't know that. How many times you heard that? I didn't know that I could buy a house. I was told that once I file bankruptcy, it's over. It's, uh, it's actually taking the time to get to know people. Oh yeah, and what 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 they want to accomplish, what problem they want to solve, and that's why I appreciate you so much. So we got to have you back. Okay, absolutely. Um, we're gonna put uh, all of your contact information, the K two currency. I want to dig on that one oh, on yeah. a whole separate. Absolutely, like this was all about getting to know you. Appreciate it. And the life that you've lived, the impact that you make every day. And Senator Reporter, like, what can I say? Do you want to come back? I think we should have you back. I'd love to have you back. Like I said, it's an honor being on the opposite side of the mic and <laughs> actually answering questions. Most of the time, I'm, I'm like you. I want to edify the guest and I appreciate what you're doing and this great place you filmed the content. And I think that uh, you're doing phenomenal work. And I, any way I can help elevate you, I want to do it. Well, you have, you've uh, always, always given more than you ever asked for. I don't think you've, you've ever asked for anything. So every thing that we do for you, like it's an honor. We really, really appreciate you. Like you're one of the best quality people in San Diego, in my opinion. 
That's awesome. I can say the same for you. Oh, man, <laughs> I appreciate that. Senator Porter, the one and only, he'll be back, and we're going to talk about podcasting because this is one of the best podcasts in San Diego. So we'll get to it. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>